I'm Susan Dittman, and I have the distinction of being born on July 4th in Philadelphia. And I grew up in New Jersey, um, couldn't help but be patriotic with that birth date and location. But I lived in several places. I went to school in upstate New York and um, then moved to Washington, D.C. And with my career, I worked for a food company. I went to Switzerland for two years, which was an incredible experience. Mm -hmm. Then Philadelphia, then Chicago. And I actually met John in Chicago and knew that um, I married him in spite of Nebraska. <laughs> so I did not want to move to Nebraska, but as I visited and met the people, I fell in love with the people of Nebraska. And so eventually we did move here. And that was 17 years ago. I would say the prairie has influenced my writing so much because Abraham Lincoln was the prairie president. So I was amazed to find that Abraham Lincoln and Nebraska have tall grass prairie in common and several prairie experts helped me. I sat beside Phyllis Reagan and she showed me, she's of Lincoln, and she showed me her photos of the prairie. I couldn't believe it's like a parade of wildflowers over the seasons. I had no idea the prairie was so beautiful. And um, Ernie Russo, he explained the prairie to me. It's incredible, there are 150 different kinds of grasses in the tall grass prairie and as many wildflowers. So I have just had so much fun learning about the prairie and my husband and I have visited Spring Creek Prairie and we've begun identifying wildflowers and it's just been a wonderful experience learning about the prairie. Well, my husband's very understanding and he's very encouraging. And our kids, um, they've endured the early drafts. <laughs> so I'm very appreciative to them. They um, actually, um, and I, I have had some very encouraging friends. The, um, I was fortunate to have two teachers who particularly were influential, so um, especially with creative writing, so I'm very grateful to them. Okay. I remember um, my grandmother sent me a notice of a contest, and it was about an, an essay contest about American freedom and freedom. So mm -hmm. I actually stayed up all night. I was about... Um, Oh, in high school, stayed up all night, submitted it in time, and it won. And um, the, unbeknownst to me, the winner was invited to read the essay at Independence um, Square on July 4th. So there were 10,000 people there, and I knew the essay backwards and forwards so I could actually enjoy the moment. And what was so incredible, as I spoke, there was an echo, and I realized that my words were bouncing off Independence Hall. And it was this timeless, marvelous connection with the Founding Fathers. I just imagine their words also bouncing off those walls. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been involved for the last 12 years with a local storytelling ministry. Mm -hmm. So we, um, through costume storytellers, portray American leaders and their, um, their lives and what will inspire children. Mm -hmm. The, um, I've been doing scripts along with another friend of mine, Lin Linda Stringham. We research these scripts and then write them for elementary age children. Mm -hmm. So I have done a lot of historical writing over the last dozen years. Mm -hmm. um, early in the morning I just like writing for myself. Mm -hmm. It's just my form of expression, just mm -hmm. writing creatively. Mm -hmm. But um, as far as um, writing for this book, it involved so much research, and I tried to do that in snatches. And I was constantly thinking, you know, about the connections and waiting for an aha moment, mm -hmm. you know. Sure. And when I got those, then I would go to the computer and write. The, um, the way I was used to writing was storytelling, for storytellers. Mm -hmm. So my writing became ellipses, dot, dot, dot and for pauses and exclamation points and in bold. So it really, um, it changed for storytelling. And then when I went to write the book, Michelle Nash, who volunteered as editor, said, Susan, what's with all these ellipses? <laughs> so I really had to change back to a normal writing, mm -hmm. so. Well, with the storytelling and the script writing, I've been writing for elementary age children. Sure. But this book is geared towards um, more mature reader, readers, um, 
middle school and on up, I would say. Mm -hmm. So, um, so it, it's in a it's a different kind of writing in that I can include more details and um, more themes. And in a book, you don't have to cut out so many wonderful stories. That's such a luxury. The um, it was so encouraging and is so encouraging to me that um, Beatrix Potter tried so many times to get her work published, A Tale of Peter Rabbit, that she ended up publishing it herself. She was rejected so many times. And Dr. Seuss um, was rejected 27 times for his first book. So that's encouraging to us all. Just keep, keep, keep persisting. Well, I can speak from experience. I have a manuscript right now that's been rejected several times. <laughs> so from my mistakes, I can share. Um, I wish I had become more aware of the publishing trends, the trends in the industry, because I wrote this manuscript as a picture book. Mm -hmm. But in researching it, and the Writer's Guide is such a valuable book, and there are many online resources. Mm -hmm. But in researching it, I discovered, for instance, there's a trend towards shorter picture books, so I've rewritten it as a chapter book. Mm -hmm. But that's the advice, one piece of advice, is to really see what the trends are. Mm -hmm. And the second piece of advice would be, whenever you're rejected, um, just make it better and get feedback from someone else and really refine the manuscript. So that's what I'm doing at least, and maybe someday it will be accepted. Well, I'm going to read, I'll, I'll read from Abraham Lincoln's Shining Star, the inspiring story of Abraham Lincoln in Nebraska. And I want to share two things about the book, one that so many people contributed to this book. It does make it unique. And secondly, I was amazed to discover that Nebraska has a very special place in the Abraham Lincoln's, in Abraham Lincoln's life, so, mm -hmm. and his legacy. Mm -hmm. I, found, I find it particularly challenging to write about history, although I do have the advantage of being a novice myself. Mm -hmm. So I know what, what is so interesting to the person who is still learning about history. And I try um, very hard to make it come alive. So I don't use date after date after date, but instead try to, if it's 1849, I'll tie it in with the gold rush. And then I try to, to make it exciting and alive, I try to include a gem on each page. For instance, um, Abraham Lincoln had a horse that he nicknamed Old Bob, and it was nicknamed Old Bob because he had a son named Bob. So little things like that just to make it come alive. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that I've found so challenging is that you have to be so careful when you're writing about history to capture what's historically accurate. There's so many nuances. So for instance, instead of saying the Transcontinental Railroad legislation, it was actually the actual name, it was the Pacific Railways Act, Pacific Railway Act. I had to write very carefully legislation creating the Transcontinental Railroad. That's just one example, but mm -hmm. and several historians were just so helpful in getting the nuances of the sentences correct. Well, I went ahead and ordered two books about Abraham Lincoln, and um, right now I'm reading Abraham Lincoln, A Life, and that was a book that won the Lincoln Prize. So I try very carefully when I read about Abraham Lincoln to only read books that have been authenticated by historians. So it's, there's so much misinformation about Abraham Lincoln out there. Mm -hmm. There was a tremendous controversy o over where the state capital would be located. Omaha wanted to keep it. It was the territorial capital. They wanted to keep mm -hmm. the capital in Omaha, of course. Mm -hmm. But the south, south of the Platte, had a population advantage. And they felt the capital deserved to be, in the, to be south of the Platte. So one um, state senator from Nebraska City proposed to move the capital south of the Platte, and a state senator from Douglas County opposed it, and his, his scheme was to name it Lincoln, because he felt this, that the um, man from Nebraska City would withdraw his proposal, because he had disliked mm -hmm. Abraham Lincoln intensely. Okay. So immediately when the proposal was made, the man from Nebraska City jumped on a chair and said, we'll take it. <laughs> so, so even though it was a dubious start, mm -hmm. I think that the 
Senator, the state senators so welcomed this name to honor Abraham Lincoln because the original name was going to be Capital City, but how much better to honor the slain president. Mm -hmm. Abraham Lincoln never set foot in Nebraska. However, he did go to Council Bluffs, Iowa, stood at the bluff and looked into, over, into the Missouri River and into the Nebraska Territory. And he must have remarked how beautiful it was. Well, I'm gonna read, I'll, I'll read from Abraham Lincoln's Shining Star, mm -hmm. the inspiring, inspiring story of Abraham Lincoln in Nebraska. Mm -hmm. And I wanna share two things about the book, one that so many people contributed to this book, mm -hmm. it does make it unique. And secondly, I was amazed to discover that Nebraska has a very special place in the Abraham Lincoln's, in Abraham Lincoln's life, so, mm -hmm. and his legacy. Good afternoon, my name is Meredith McGowan and I am the curator of the Heritage Room. I'd like to welcome you to the Heritage Room and to the John A. James Reading Series. We're very excited that this reading series has been in existence for more than 25 years and that this is the 202nd reading. And I thank you for being here. I also um, would like to welcome my children's literature class from UNL. Some of them are here today joining us for the program, so thanks. We are here in the Jane Pope Geske Heritage Room of Nebraska Authors. It is a special collection that's dedicated to promoting and preserving works by and about Nebraska authors. This is a representative collection, of course, because we can't put everything in this room. Um, more than 13,000 volumes written by more than 3,000 Nebraska authors. And of course, we do have information files, magazines, pictures, manuscripts, um, artwork. You can kind of look around the room and you'll see some different pieces of artwork and memorabilia around the room. And by the way, I do want to let you know that the Heritage Room is not tax supported, hasn't been for quite a few years. It is supported by the Nebraska Literary Heritage Association, and we'd like to thank the NLHA for the endowment that they established a number of years ago through their volunteer efforts. And um, also for the Lincoln, the Foundation for Lincoln City Libraries, the two groups work uh, together for fundraising and so forth for the Heritage Room. Um, and we'd also like to thank those who contributed recently to the Heritage Room Endowment Fund during our campaign last year. Um, we invite you to visit the Heritage Room during our regular public service hours. We're open Tuesday through Friday from 12 to 3 and on Sundays from 2 to 5. And um, we're actually open right now, so here we are enjoying uh, each other's company and, and a program in the Heritage Room. The Ames readings are filmed on Five City TV, so if you're not here in the room watching the program today, I just want you to know that we're located on the third floor of Bennett Martin Public Library on 14th and N Streets in downtown Lincoln, and that the Ames readings are currently held on the third Sunday of the month at 2 p.m. <coughs> Excuse me. Our reader today is Susan Grace Dittman. She was born in Philadelphia, and she's lived in a number of places around, as well as Lincoln. She has degrees from Cornell University and Northwestern University. Her interest in historical writing, I think, led her to write Abraham Lincoln's Shining Star, the inspiring story of Abraham Lincoln and Nebraska. In it, she con connects Nebraska and Lincoln the only U.S. capital, of course, that's state capital that's named after our 16th president. Um, and she connects that with Abraham Lincoln's influence on the state's formation and development. Um, Susan's book is found in the LCL youth collection, but I believe it's actually a book for all ages. So I'm really happy to have Susan here with us today, and I hope you'll help me welcome her. It's such an honor to be invited to speak here today, and it's especially meaningful because I spent so many hours researching in this collection, um, many, many hours, so I, um, it is a special honor. I wanted to share with you today what makes this book unique, and there are two things. First of all, it actually, I call it a stone soup book in a selfless way. So many people contributed their time and talents, and I'll explain why in a moment. The other um, aspect that is unique is the message. 
And most Americans would agree that more than any state, um, Abraham Lincoln was shaped by Illinois. But few Americans and few Nebraskans realize that more than any state, Abraham Lincoln shaped Nebraska. The reason it's a stone soup kind of book is that um, every penny from the sale of this book actually is donated to a, a local Lincoln ministry. And that ministry is called um, America's Great Stories. Um, there are so many, that ministry is um, a storytelling ministry for elementary age children. And every summer we present um, through costume storytellers the true story of American leaders. We include their faith in God and we include kid-friendly information like pets and nicknames, things that the children really love. The, um, the, we've been doing this for 12 years, so now we've realized we can put some of these stories into book form, and this is our first such book. When I first um, submitted that, when I submitted the original manuscript, the board of directors very gently and kindly and wisely rejected it. Uh, members of our board are Eleanor Gillette, Carolyn Croker, Ellen Cole, and um, Roberta Newburn helps tremendously. So I went back to the drawing board, and lo and behold, Michelle Nash volunteered as editor, and that made all the difference. So when I resubmitted it, they were pleased, and um, I did this with tremendous help. Um, the, I want to point out some of the people who've been instrumental, and this website was designed by Lincoln Christian High School students, and even the logo was designed by them. Um, a woman, Lynn Weinman of Weinman Communications Group, stepped forward and designed a Facebook for the book. Um, you can certainly, you're welcome to visit it and friend it. It's found at Abraham Lincoln Shining Star. Um, Watson Hirschberger donate their services. There's just so many people who've donated um, their time. It's, it's just beautiful to bring this book about. So even though one person is standing here, um, so many people are part of the book. Um, two people who were also instrumental were um, Jim Potter of the Nebraska State Historical Society. I'm a history sleuth. I'm not a historian. Um, he was instrumental, as was Dr. James Cornelius. He's actually curator of the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library. He reviewed the manuscript, and he actually endorsed the book. And I remember going to the mailbox, getting the manuscript with his comments on it, and reading his endorsement. And this is what he wrote. What a marvelous and surprising story. Who knew how closely Nebraska and its capital reflect so many key themes in Abraham Lincoln's life? And when I read that endorsement, I thought, oh my goodness, this actually is going to come about. Um, we tried to illustrate this book, but we soon found out that that would be cost prohibitive. We wanted to price the book at less than $20 for each book, but it would cost $40,000 to have it illustrated. So immediately we realized that pictures were the way to go. And I Googled to find the best photographs that I possibly could and went ahead and contacted those um, photographers. And with one exception, every single photographer donated their work. And this cover is an example, um, the, and these are photographers from around the country. The Abraham Lincoln was colorized from an old photograph by a gentleman in Virginia. The prairie was donated by um, Paul Johnsgaard of the University of Nebraska. It's a beautiful picture. And the skyscape was taken over Valentine. It was um, photographed by a gentleman from Iowa. As an example of just the um, creativity, I needed a shot to balance a picture. A man from California donated a picture of the Abraham Lincoln Monument in the memorial in Washington, D.C., and I needed a picture to balance that. And interestingly, both um, the Abraham Lincoln statue in Washington, D.C. and the statue at the Lincoln Capitol were sculpted by the same man, Daniel Chester French. So I contacted the, um, the most creative photographer that I knew, and that's David Dale. And he actually went three nights, this is such dedication, three nights saw, um, saw the statue on a cloudy day, on a sunny day, and he decided the best opportunity was at night. And he climbed on a ladder and ranged the lighting and came up with this beautiful shot. We did need to develop seven um, illustrations because, um, and my favorite, I want to start off by saying my all-time favorite is the one on the last page. It's a stovepipe hat, and it was um, drawn by our daughter while she was in high school. 
But the um, six of the illustrations, we couldn't find photos of these illustrations. So we needed to commission the drawings, and our book designer stepped forward and basically donated her s um, services for these illustrations. Yeah, thank you. And just as an example of how people contributed, an Abraham Lincoln impersonator named Lee Williams from Iota, Iowa, actually volunteered to come to Lincoln and pose for our adult illustrations of Abraham Lincoln. So he actually posed um, with a cardboard tube to portray Abraham Lincoln um, looking at the, um, through the, at the observatory at the stars. I had a working title for the book from the very start, and that was Abraham Lincoln's Shining Star, playing on the um, capital star theme. But as I researched Abraham Lincoln, I was so surprised that he loved the stars. And I'll show you this, that um, pose, Lee Williams' pose became this illustration. And the, we tried with each illustration to get it historically accurate. So the background for this illustration is based on the, a photograph of the Naval Observatory, as it would have looked in Abraham Lincoln's time. It was taken a few um, years after his death. So that's um, just, to me, fascinating that he loved the star so much. And in the introduction, I would like to read this to you. It summarizes his love for the stars. President Lincoln loved to study the stars. As a boy in the woodlands of Kentucky and then Indiana, he and his family would gaze at the stars from their tree-encircled clearing. On more than one occasion, Abe must have climbed a tree in the childish hope that by peering through its upper branches, he could get a closer look at the stars. Did he wonder how many are there and how do they shine? Abraham Lincoln's fascination with stars grew when, as an adult, he spent 30 years on or near the open prairie. There, the star-spangled night skies are spectacular. Indeed, at night, the prairie seems to become a vast open-air theater, where the grasses and wildflowers give a standing ovation, the insects buzz their applause, and the fireflies signal their, their delight at the starry display. How could he not have become enthralled by stars? As Lincoln traveled through the prairie on the circuit, he sometimes gave his horse free rein while he lounged in the boogie and read a book about astronomy. He would then eagerly examine the night sky so he could verify what he had just studied. He once said that he could not rest when handling a thought until he had, quote, bounded it north and bounded it south and bounded it east and bounded it west, end quote. The fathomless night sky, however, defied his attempts to understand it completely, so the more he learned about stars, the more curious he became. During his presidency, he enjoyed riding by horseback in the evening to the Naval Observatory. There he could view the heavens through the most powerful telescope in the country. He must have peered at the, at the celestial bodies with awe as he plied the astronomer with questions. In his wildest dreams, President Lincoln could not have imagined that a special star would be named in his honor. What a fitting tribute. He would have been both humbled and delighted to learn of the Lincoln star. Ever curious, he would have inquired about its exact position so he could view it through the telescope. How surprised Abraham Lincoln would have been to learn that his star is not in the sky. It is on today's map of the United States. The 50 stars on the U.S. map represent state capitals, and Nebraska's capital is the only one named Lincoln in his honor. What a perfect location, because Abraham Lincoln's decisions as president influenced Nebraska more than any other state. The president would have been equally surprised to discover that a state capital star actually shines, and in an amazing faith-filled way. Please, President Lincoln would lightly have exclaimed with great anticipation, tell me its story. And I'd like to tell you this story right now. Um, to tell this story, I tried to find maps that showed the clear progression of Nebraska from the Louisiana Purchase to its present day boundaries, but I couldn't find any maps. So we actually commissioned a gentleman from Oregon to computerize these maps. But you can see that um, Nebraska lay at the center of Louisiana, the Louisiana Purchase. It was originally called Nebraska by the Oto tribe, and that 
name means flat waters because water flowed from the top of the Rocky Mountains all the way through Nebraska to the Missouri River. And that's why it came to be called flat waters. The, um, you can see that Kentucky actually abuts the Louisiana Purchase. And that um, shows that it was indeed a frontier state. Now, President Jefferson made the purchase in 1803. That's six years before Abraham Lincoln was born. And Meriwether Lewis was immediately commissioned by Jefferson to explore the purchase and find a passage to the Pacific Ocean. And he contacted his friend William Clark, who lived in Clarksville, Indiana. So Meriwether Lewis and William Clark met up in Clarksville, Indiana. Now what's so interesting about that is it was right on the Ohio River. It was at the southern edge of, Indi of Indiana, the Indiana Territory. And news of this exciting expedition spread up and down the Ohio River. Well, what is so interesting about that is that Thomas Lincoln lived just 60 miles from the Ohio River. And I know that because I got out an atlas and a ruler, and I confirmed it with MapQuest. <laughs> the, um, the pair recruited, and I wondered, did Thomas Lincoln, he was a bachelor at the time, did he actually consider going on this exciting expedition? The pair left with their um, <coughs> Corps of Discovery and departed on the Corps of Discovery. And they actually went to the um, up the Platte River Valley for a short way, and then they returned and followed the Missouri River, which is what the path Thomas Jefferson had instructed them to follow. On the way, on the return, Clark, uh, William Clark went to Clarksville, returned to Clarksville, and Meriwether Lewis again passed within 60 miles of Thomas Lincoln's cabin. By this time, he was married to Mary, uh, to Nancy Lincoln. And they um, very well could have heard about the Nebraska country, the Nebraska area, and they um, certainly heard about the Louisiana Purchase and the um, exciting expedition. We can be so proud of the beauty of our state, and that's a theme through the book, because um, when William Clark first observed the Platte River Valley, he said these words, Captain Lewis and myself walked in the prairie on top of the bluff and observed the most beautiful prospects imaginable. He wrote those words. Obviously, I couldn't find a picture of Abraham Lincoln, a photograph of him as a newborn. And there was one statue with him as a baby, but I needed a newborn illustration. So Carol did this, Carol Tornatore. We used the background. It was a replica of the um, original log cabin. The curator said that um, Nancy Lincoln likely resembled Abraham Lincoln, and she definitely would have been tired. There was dirt everywhere. That was the other thing he said. There was dirt everywhere because it was a dirt-floored log cabin. But Carolyn Croker encouraged me to come up with a better opening sentence to the book. So I worked hard. And this is the sentence, the opening sentence to the book. It's a boy undoubtedly rang forth on February 12, 1809, in a simple cabin in the frontier state of Kentucky. So I hadn't realized how important the, um, how much time one can spend on just one opening sentence. <laughs> yeah. Another theme of the book is the prairie. And Abraham Lincoln knew the prairie well. He was, of course, called the prairie president. But he, um, the first time he, he mentions the prairie, he referred to a time when he was 21. And he wrote, my father and family settled a new place at the junction of the timberland and prairie where we fenced and broke ground. What was amazing to me to find was that the tall grass prairie actually begins in western Indiana and sweeps all the way to 60 miles west of Lincoln, Nebraska. So we have Lincoln, Nebraska has the tall grass prairie in common with Abraham Lincoln. It's about 15, 10 to 15 feet high in um, the area that Abraham Lincoln lived and traveled. But by the time the, the rainfall diminishes as you head west, and in this area it's about three feet tall. Further west it shrinks to mixed grass and then short grass prairie. Another theme of the book is um, Abraham Lincoln's faith in God. Um, I couldn't believe to find that during his presidency he referred to the Bible more often than any president before or since. Um, 
according to the curator, it was during the time, and I'd like to read this, of his um, second-born child's death that Abraham Lincoln really began searching for God. And this is what um, I wrote. We lost our little boy, Abraham Lincoln wrote, in early 1850 upon three-year-old Eddie's death. We miss him very much, he added numbly. This tragedy prompted Abraham to move from doubting whether God really existed to an honest searching for God. That spring he rode on the circuit and grieved with a wildflower blanketed prairie as his comforting friend. He began to read his Bible in earnest and realized that the Bible was what it claimed to be, the Word of God. And those are his words that he wrote during his presidency. And some of the other quotes, and these are just a few of the countless quotes. Um, and I actually am fortunate to have my grandmother's um, King James version of the Bible, which um, I was able to, so to reference as a source, and that was meaningful to me. But um, that's the version that Abraham Lincoln read. And so once you read that, those um, passages, you more readily recognize the references to the Bibles in his speeches. But he wrote, Whatever shall appear to be God's will, I will do. But for it, the Bible, we could not know right from wrong. And he from whom all blessings flow must not be forgotten. The um, Abraham Lincoln spent eight years as a state legislator and two years as a representative in Congress in Washington, D.C. He then um, went back to Springfield, and he began campaigning for Zachary Taylor, who was running for the presidency, hoping to get a political appointment in Washington, D.C. However, um, once Zachary Taylor won, he promptly forgot about Abraham Lincoln. The um, people don't realize, and I didn't, but Abraham Lincoln actually retired in disillusionment from politics. He retired for six years, beginning with, um, in 1849, the same year as the California Gold Rush. So as you can imagine, pioneers were just flooding the Platte River Highway, as it was called. And Nebraska, by this time, was called Nebraska Country. And when I first came to Lincoln, I couldn't believe that none of the pioneers actually settled in the beautiful prairie along the way. They made such a beeline for Chimney Rock. But when I came across this map, I realized that, and designed this map, um, I realized that it was all Indian country. So it was off limits to white settlers. Um, the only people allowed in that, in the Indian country were white soldiers, and the only whites allowed were soldiers, missionaries, and then squatters, of course, settled there. Yeah. The um, Abraham Lincoln said, um, well, Abraham Lincoln, his good friend Stephen Douglas, um, that's another theme in the book, but there's a tremendous rivalry between Stephen Douglas and Abraham Lincoln. The, um, Stephen Douglas went on to the Senate. He was, had a powerful position in the Senate. He was chairman of the U.S. Senate Committees on Territory, Committee on Territories. And in that position, he would name places out west in return for the person who wanted a political favor. So that's how he grew powerful. And in fact, Douglas County, he likely influenced the naming of that county for himself. He was not humble at all. He was called the Little Giant. But he um, was determined to have a transcontinental railroad. And he wanted it anchored in Chicago, which was his hometown. And perhaps that's the reason that he championed for so many years something called a Nebraska Bill. And he finally issued it in 18, um, 1853. And that the horrible thing about this bill was that it shrank Indian country all the way to present-day Oklahoma, as you can see. Now, pretend Kansas isn't there because he actually, in 1853, in the Nebraska Bill, the Nebraska Territory he proposed extended from Indian country all the way to present-day Canada. So it was a vast territory. The B Nebraska Bill went back to committee and he reissued it in an, with an act that was called the Nebraska-Kansas Act. And you might think, well, I learned it as the Kansas-Nebraska Act. However, um, during Abraham Lincoln's time, it was called the Nebraska-Kansas Act because Nebraska was the pivotal part of that act. Because um, Stephen Douglas created Kansas, actually, 
and this is so satisfying to say, as an afterthought. <laughs> he really did. <laughs> and um, the other thing he did, and he perhaps did that to appease the South. There was Southern opposition to this bill. The South wanted a transcontinental railroad to go through the Southern, take a Southern route through Texas on the way to California. But Stephen Douglas introduced popular sovereignty into these two territories. But there was something called the Missouri Compromise, and that's the imaginary line from the southern Missouri all the way through the former lands of the Louisiana Purchase. That Missouri Compromise stated that there could be no, slavery was forbidden in the lands north of that, la that line. What was so incredible is that in his act, Stephen Douglas repealed the Missouri Compromise. And outcry spread in the North like a racing, crackling prairie fire. Abraham Lincoln himself said he was thunderstruck and stunned, and he was roused as never before. And he would be looking at the fire in the stove when his colleagues went to sleep on the circuit. And when they awakened, he would still be staring at the fire. And he emerged from political retirement as a statesman. He was well-versed in the Bible by this time, and included that in many of his speeches, and he had also been studying Shakespeare and had the cadences of Shakespeare. And he was just a beautiful speaker stepping out to speak about the, this act. And in fact, he said at one point, I plainly see that you and I would differ about the Nebraska law. That's what he called it. I look upon that enactment not as a law, but as a violence from the beginning. So you, you could actually say that, Ab that Nebraska set Abraham Lincoln on the path to the presidency. Now, I'll fast forward to 1859, four years later, and he was actually campaigning unofficially for the presidency, for the nomination of his party, and he was in Iowa. He actually stood and looked at the, in Council Bluffs, Iowa, and looked into the Nebraska Territory. He must have admired the view, and afterwards he said that this would be a perfect place for a transcontinental railroad to follow the Platte River Valley. He also met in Iowa a staunch supporter named Alvin Saunders, and I just would like you to remember that name. In 1860, he ran for the presidency, and what was so amazing, he actually ran against Stephen Douglas. Douglas was one of the three candidates who ran against Abraham Lincoln, and actually they split the vote, so Abraham Lincoln won. And as soon as Abraham Lincoln won, states began seceding from the Union. This must have been a, it was a terrible time of trial for Abraham Lincoln. The, um, he did receive in 1861, the beginning of 1861, very encouraging news because the Nebraska Territory had gone ahead and outlawed, outlawed slavery within its borders. Must have been an incredible encouragement to him. Yeah. Shortly after the Nebraska-Kansas Act was passed, um, a settler named William Donovan came to this area. He called it Lancaster after his hometown in Pennsylvania, and he was attracted to the salt that lay in the, the Lincoln, the basin around the Lancaster area. And this is a picture from Phyllis Reagan of that. You can still find salt in this area, but pioneers and settlers would travel from far away to gather the salt before it washed away. Now, Abraham Lincoln's faith had deepened so much by the time he departed for Washington, D.C., that he spoke as farewell to a crowd in Springfield, and he said, trusting in him who can go with me and remain with you and be everywhere for good, let us confidently hope that all will yet be well. The, um, in Philadelphia, he actually stood by um, the Liberty Bell, raised a flag, and said, I would rather be assassinated on this spot than surrender the principle of liberty for all. How prophetic that was. He then, there was a well-founded um, assassination plot against him. So he ended up sneaking into Washington, bypassing Baltimore, and sneaking at least a stop in Baltimore, and he sneaked into Washington, D.C. in the early dawn hours. It was that much of a threat. Just two days before his inauguration, outgoing President Buchanan signed legislation that created the Dakota Territory. 
And as you can see, this reduced the Nebraska Territory to one quarter of its size. What astonished me was that the panhandle extended all the way into the Utah Territory. In 1861, shortly after, in the summer of 1861, shortly after he was inaugurated, um, the Secretary of War requested that the Nebraska Territory raise a regiment of 1,000 men. Now, many of the Nebraska men had already joined Illinois, Iowa, and um, even Pennsylvania's regiments to fight in the, for the Union. But um, the the first Nebraska Volunteer Infantry went to Missouri, and there they um, fought in skirmishes, but then they fought in the Battle of um, Fort Donelson. After this battle, church bells rang in the north. It was such a pivotal victory. And U.S. Grant earned his nickname, Unconditional Surrender, at this battle. But this is what their, um, their commanding general said. He was Lou. Wallace, and he actually wrote the, went on to write um, Ben-Hur, A Tale of the Christ. But Lew Wallace said about the Nebraskans, and we can be so proud of his comments, he said, quote, they met the storm, no man flinching, and their fire was terrible. To say they did well is not enough. Their conduct was splendid. They alone repelled the charge. It's possible that Abraham Lincoln heard about the role that the Nebraskans played in this battle. However, he was at his son Willie's bedside as Willie was dying. The um, Nebraskans also went on to fight in the Battle of Shiloh with a narrow victory there. That um, in the in 1862, Abraham Lincoln signed into law because the South had seceded there was no more political opposition to three pieces of legislation. The first major one that impacted Nebraska was the Morrill Act. It was also called the Land Grant College Act. And this meant that states were given land that they could sell to fund higher level, um, institutions of higher learning for agriculture as well as the mechanical arts. This act would eventually lead to the creation of the University of Nebraska. So we can thank Abraham Lincoln for that land-grant institution. The second was the um, Homestead Act, which would impact Nebraska incredibly. And the third was the Transcontinental Railroad Act. Now, interestingly, Abraham Lincoln um, was the person who decided where the um, Transcontinental Railroad, which path it would follow. And after months of controversy, he actually chose the central route, which meant it would be construction would begin in Iowa, in Omaha City. So it was his decision to do that. The war was not going well in 1862 and in the summer of 1862, and Abraham Lincoln wanted to issue the Emancipation Proclamation. He met with his cabinet, and they they recommended, um, Secretary of State Seward recommended that he hold off and um, not release the Emancipation Proclamation until there was a Union victory. So he locked it in his drawer, his desk drawer. And afterwards, he told his cabinet that this is what he did. He said, quote, I made a solemn vow before God that if General Lee were driven back from Maryland, I would crown the result by the declaration of freedom to the slaves. And Lee had invaded Maryland, and he was threatening to invade Washington, D.C., so the city was in a panic. Now, seven weeks later, Abraham Lincoln's prayer was answered in a remarkable way. And I know it was seven weeks because I got out the calendar. But the um, people, it was commonly known, it was called the cigar story. It was commonly known once. But this is the true story. There was a Union boy, an Abraham Lincoln boy in blue, Union soldier, who was in a meadow in Maryland, and he found a package of three cigars with battle plans wrapped around the cigars. Now, he took the battle plans to General McClellan, and it turns out that, um, that General Lee actually had a um, general who loved to smoke cigars, and so he cleverly sent this package, and a careless courier dropped it. Even with these battle plans, McClellan dilly-dallied, but finally won the very costly Battle of Antietam, and Lee was driven from Maryland. 
And with that, Abraham Lincoln, true to his word, released the draft of the Emancipation Proclamation. Yes. Now, in 1863, Congress issued legislation that reconfigured the Dakota Territory, and you can see it chopped the Nebraska panhandle almost in half. And it's Nebraska, at that point, was roughly its current boundaries. The um, two weeks before the Gettysburg Address in November of 1863, Abraham Lincoln, um, this picture was taken two weeks before the Gettysburg Address, and he worked long and hard on that address. What um, Gabor Borit, a Lincoln historian, he actually reported this. He said that Abraham Lincoln was likely inspired by Psalm 90 of the Bible. Now that's the only psalm that was written by Moses. The, um, both men led and were leading millions of slaves to freedom. And verse 10 of that psalm reads, If the years of our life be threescore years and ten, or if by reason of strength they be fourscore years. You can see the inspiration for the opening lines of the Gettysburg Address. Abraham Lincoln had remembered um, Alvin Saunders, his supporter in Iowa, and soon after he was elected, he appointed Alvin Saunders to be governor of the Nebraska Territory. In 1864, Abraham Lincoln actually signed the legislation. It was called the Nebraska Enabling Act, and this invited Nebraska Territory to pursue statehood in the Union. The, um, in 1865, on April 14th, Abraham Lincoln actually signed the certificate that reauthorized, um, that reappointed Alvin Saunders as territorial governor. And Nebraska was on Abraham Lincoln's mind because this was the man who would eventually lead this territory into statehood. And that night, Abraham Lincoln went to Ford's Theater. Now, as he lay on his deathbed, a gentleman named Phineas Gurley, was, who was his good pastor and friend, um, actually told the people surrounding the bed, they, he said, gentlemen, let us pray. And as Abraham Lincoln drew his last breaths, the gentlemen, the men around him actually knelt down and prayed. And Phineas Gurley was the one who actually gave the eulogy beside, in the White House beside the open casket of Abraham Lincoln. And the nation obviously mourned, and this was such a beautiful quote by Pastor Henry Ward Beecher. He wrote, we Return him to you, Illinois, a mighty conqueror, not thine anymore, but the nation's, not ours, but the world's. Give him place, O ye prairies. And I do want to read a paragraph about that. And earlier in the book, I wrote that um, Old Bob was Abraham Lincoln's favorite horse, and they named him Old Bob so he wouldn't be confused with his son, Bob. <laughs> but in Springfield, Illinois, a riderless old Bob walked behind the carriage that carried his master's coffin. The funeral procession made its way to the cemetery, where Abraham Lincoln's body was placed in a receiving vault. The prairie that he so loved lay nearby. From the heights of Lincoln's burial place, visitors can still watch the sun set in a glorious blaze over the very western land that ignited his passion to defend liberty for all. Now, I had this working title, Abraham Lincoln's Shining Star, and I did not know how the book would end. So I'm getting to the end of Abraham Lincoln's life, and I thought, aha, why don't I pray as Abraham Lincoln did? And I did that, and knowing that God answers even the smallest of prayers, and the next morning I woke up with these words impressed on my heart, go to the eulogy. Now, I'd never read the eulogy, and I went to it, and it is such a beautiful eulogy and statement by Phineas Gurley, his good friend. And in that eulogy were the words, to emulate your bright example will be the truest mark of our respect, the best tribute we can offer. So that's how Abraham Lincoln's tiny star shines. In a, it's in a figurative way. The um, beautiful thing about Nebraska history, and I found this in, in the collection here was that there are many Nebraskans who have emulated Abraham Lincoln's bright example. 
And I just want to share two of the six stories with you. But we can be so proud of the canteen. We can be so proud of the orphan train. There are so many just examples that we can be so proud of. But, um, oh, keep going if you would, sorry. I neglected to mention that um, after Nebraska became a state, they, um, settlers flocked to the Nebraska Territory. And that was, um, you can see this is from the Nebraska um, National, Homestead National Monument of America. It's on their website. And you can see that Nebraska leads the country as far as the percentage of successfully claimed land. This is incredible. It was incredible to discover this for, um, and North Dakota is second with 39%. But what was so incredible is that the states most commonly associated with Abraham Lincoln were Indiana, Kentucky, and Illinois, and they're barely on this chart because they were primarily settled by this time. Now, the Transcontinental Railroad went across the entire length of Nebraska, and it was funded by land grants. So if you include the percentage, it was 10% of Nebraska's land that was um, settled as a result of the um, Transcontinental Railroad land grants, you can see that more than half of Nebraska's land was settled as a result of Abraham Lincoln's policies. As, um, as settlement went westward in Nebraska, and as Union soldiers um, assumed leadership roles in the new state, the, um, they named counties for people whom Abraham Lincoln respected. During the Civil War, three counties were renamed because the namesakes actually fled to the Confederacy. That was, <laughs> he, two were named for his cabinet members, uh, Stanton and Seward, and one was actually named Lincoln County, and one was named, um, um, one was named for Alvin Saunders, his supporter. But you can see um, that 24 of our 93 counties, or one-fourth, can actually be linked in some way to Abraham Lincoln. And that's unique around for, for a state. The man I wanted to share with you today, um, and two, two men actually, two stories that I think will be of great interest to you. One is Reverend John M. Young, and he was the founder of Lincoln, Nebraska, although it was, he named it Lancaster Village. He arrived in 1864, and his son was fighting in the Union War. He was a Methodist minister. His goal was to start a female seminary, a seminary for females. That was a ludicrous idea because there were so few females in the entire Nebraska Territory, <laughs> let alone any who could spare the time to study at a seminary. But his seminary, he built it and it burned down. But he said he had three dreams. One was to start a female seminary, which he did. The second was to found a village that actually would become a new state capital. And this was before the state even existed. The um, final dream was that this village would become a um, county seat. And all three dreams of his came true. I just want to read um, a paragraph about Reverend Young. He believed it was right to serve others with humility and love, whether it meant facing winter storms or camping out at night. Where any good was to be accomplished, no task was too hard for him. A friend of his concluded, quote, among the useful and good, he was among the best. In his largely unnoticed way, Reverend Young followed Abraham Lincoln's bright example. And then Robert Ball is another gentleman who had a tremendous impact. He went from being a slave who was tortured to being a Buffalo soldier to being one of the largest land owners, black land owners in Nebraska's history. And he was so kind to union to black young men. And he said, be worthy of the sacrifice that was made on your behalf. Um, the most powerful story that I know is the story of Edward Parsons Smith. In 1919, he ran for the mayorship of Omaha. That was a courageous move because the um, city of Omaha was such a corrupt and wild place. It was run by a political machine. The, um, he, was, 
he actually won and unseated the political the crony and that made the the boss of the political machine so angry that he began to foment racial unrest in order to unseat and thwart mayor um, smith the Unrest culminated when um, a, a black man, Will Brown, was uh, so, um, accused of allegedly assaulting a white woman. The charges were never proven. But the, they, the crowd, a mob grew and approached the courthouse, and Edward Smith raced ahead of the mob and got to the courthouse, and he tried vainly to call for federal reinforcements, which never arrived. The prisoners were so desperate, the other prisoners, that they actually tried to throw Will Brown to the mob. And Edward Parson Smith, as people were scaling the walls and throwing stones into the windows, the people were, um, it was just out of control, but, Abra but Edward Parson Smith did the unthinkable. He walked down the flight of stairs, he unlocked the door, and he walked into the crowd. And he said, if you must lynch someone, let it be me. And the crowd did. Then they proceeded to lynch Will Brown in what must have been the lowest point of our state's history. City detectives raced to find um, Edward Parson Smith's body and retrieve it. And they cut the noose and found that he was still breathing. They rushed him to a hospital, and he spent two weeks in delirium near death. But he eventually recovered and went on to finish his mayorship, but he never fully recovered emotionally. But you can see that um, Edward Parson Smith was willing to risk his life um, for the sake of another. So I just want to leave you today with this thought. We can build monuments to Abraham Lincoln, beautiful monuments. We can name streets after him. We can name even a county, Lincoln County. We can even name a capital city, Lincoln. But the best tribute we could ever give to Abraham Lincoln would be to emulate his bright example of standing for what is right and relying on God to do this. Thank you.